Hi everybody, it's Terry Ryder from hotspotting.com.au um, bringing today's special webinar event, How to Get a Loan in this New World of Banking. And I'm here with um, the number one individual um, to speak about that very topic, I think. I Thank can't you. have anyone better, well, with better knowledge on this topic than Louise Lucas from the Property Education Company. Hello, Louise. Hello, Terry. Lovely to have you here in Melbourne. Yeah, look, I do a lot of webinars, seminars on this year I've done you know, a record number on all sorts of topics, but I don't think right now there's a more important topic to be talking about is this, this whole subject of how you get a loan in this new world of banking because it, it's really become so pivotal what's happening in property markets right now. Absolutely, and it's more confusing than ever and there's so much you can do to protect yourself and help you and that's what we're here to do today. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm just going to hand over to you to go through your presentation. I just think that, um, yeah, this, this is incredibly timely. Um, we seem to be in this hiatus with, with, uh, with residential real estate in Australia where um, too many things have been stymied by the, the new attitude of the big banks and their attitudes to lending. And um, so people just need to know how to work their way through the maze. And um, Totally. Well, I hope to give you some good information today. Okay. So, first up, welcome to sunny Melbourne because Terry's here from wet Queensland, so that's really lovely that we've got the best weather. How about that? But anyway, yeah. now, um, for anyone who's on the webinar, please uh, pop into the chat and tell us your name and say hello because we'd love to know who's listening and if there's anything particular you want at any point in time, please just pop your name in and, and ask your question. So In the Q&A panel. In the Q&A panel, if people can see that on the screen. At the bo uh, usually bottom or top of your, well, your Zoom. It could be different for, for different people, but um, on their control panel, they should see Q&A. That's where they can type in their questions or comments as we move forward. And we're going to have plenty of time at the end of the presentation to, to answer as many questions as we can. Terrific. Great. Oh, it's lovely to see some familiar names there. Hi, Harry. Hi, Karina. Hi, Vincent. And I could, could I say hi to Ken while seeing you, who's, who's somebody that I know, who's always seems to tune in to our, um, to our webinars. Hi, Kemla. Terrific. Thank you. And thanks for coming along. We're thrilled to have you all here. This has been very popular, this, this topic, and it's for good reason because it is so complex at the moment. Uh, the Royal Commission has given banks uh, the, the willies, obviously scared, <laughs> and particularly the major banks. Uh, I get the excuse almost every day when I'm speaking to credit advisors, oh, it's because of the Royal Commission ways that we can't approve whatever, whatever. And it's just a really great excuse for them to uh, refuse borrowers that they don't understand or can't help when really in normal circumstances they would be fighting over themselves to get them as a loan. And I'll give you an example. I've got a single mum client who uh, she'd have to be one of the best asset and liability positions in the country. She owns her own home. She has to outright... She has two investment properties. They're only at 60% loan to value ratio, so 60% LVR. We just wanted to refi because the current lender was charging a well over 5% for the interest, as they tend to do if you've been with them a few years. And part of her income is paid um, tax-free. So some lenders just won't look at it, which is just crazy. And the other thing, they seem to be avoiding people on a single income. I was actually told by someone, oh, you know, we're not sure if someone's on one income, for God's sake. Anyway, so it's very scary. So you have to be, uh, we find that most loans that we're doing at the moment, you'll do them once somewhere and then you'll have to take them somewhere else because of some obscure reason. But for the first time in my broking career, which is nearly 12 years, people are coming to me and saying, oh, get me out of those big four, which is Quite, quite a welcome relief because there's so many more opportunities out there uh, with second tier lenders at the moment. And here's a chart which we've got just showing the big fall off in investor lending. Now this happened in two stages. The first was when they implemented a, an increase in interest rates for investors and a lot of people who were actually living in their own home and but had for whatever reason got a, an investment loan suddenly went to the bank and said, hey, I'm actually living here. This is my owner-occupied home now. 
uh, can I have a reduced interest rate? So there was a big drop in what was perceived investor lending, but it was actually because people were actually living there. Then it increased again and it's been easing off. So if they have certainly made it a lot harder for investors this last year. And so there are particularly those people with large portfolios, but there are lenders out there who will help. So never fear. And our intention for you today is to be winners. We want you to get a ton of information and I intend to outline the key rules that the lenders are looking at and what you can do to prepare yourself to get uh, a loan through the process easily and successfully. And throughout the presentation, I'll give you a series of questions to ask lenders as you go. And one, one key thing you've got to do when you take away, which I'll be telling you about later. Just that on this, you might wonder, oh, winner's poster, but I love this. When you need to cheer up, go to despair.com because this is actually the full poster. It says nothing says you're a loser more than owning a poster that says you're a winner. But anyway, I just think that's fun. Okay, so just to tell you a bit about me, I've been doing loans since 2007 for other people and been buying my own property and uh, getting loans since the mid-1980s when actually they'd only look at my husband, they didn't care whether I was even working. They go, that was the lovely patronising time, fabulous. But anyway, actually, and then I went on into finance, so now they talk to me only. But anyway, and he, uh, so in 2016, I'll let you know, I won the National Mortgage Broker of the Year Award from the um, Australian Mortgage and Finance Association. I won the Better Business Award for Customer Service. We've won the Achiever Award for Excellence in Finance. and. I'm not trying to tell you this because so you know, oh gosh, you know, she won a lot of awards, whoopie do. But I just want you to know my experience has been long and hard won. And I just wish someone had explained some of these rules to me about finance as uh, years ago when I was getting started and into property throughout the years. People rarely explain what's going on. And I constantly find this a problem for clients. They come and they don't know why they've been refused, but they are regularly refused loans at the moment. And for no good reason, it's just because they didn't understand how to apply and they shouldn't have gone ahead with the lender they were with because the people dealing with it weren't uh, competent enough for the task as well. Or so they've ended up being stuck paying too high an in interest rate. So it's really important to get good advice. I know I'm just, sounds like I'm only promoting brokers and that's true, but that's why, particularly following the Royal Commission, more people are doing their loans through mortgage brokers than ever before. It's up near 55%. I don't know how anyone can, can find their way through the maze without having a mortgage broker on the team. I mean, it's incomprehensible to me. It's changing every day. I actually watched you this morning, a uh, half an hour ago, dealing with emails of all the income changes just today. Yeah, um, it's true. And you have to be abreast. And we're from we're getting you know thirty odd lenders sending us updates most days. So we have a team in the background just keeping us on top of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what chance the average consumer are keeping that? Well, if they wanted to go and sort, I, I, I laugh when they say, oh, I'll go online, I'll go, good luck, that would just confuse you more. But let's get back to what we're going to help you with yeah. because I do have questions you can use to ask them, no matter who's doing your loan, so that you can do this. I want you to be feel confident at least that you've got an idea but if you need help and you want a loan done, please contact me at Louise at Property Ed. Uh, so, on we go. Oh, the finance, you know the routine. However, I do feel like this, this because it feels like, you know, from uh, insurance, it applies the same. After reviewing the details of pre-existing condition. And one of the problems is with finance disclaimers, that's what it sounds like. You know, if you take one snippet of advice and run off and deal with it, well, okay. It might be on your head. There it is. Anyway, but in the next 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to go through across the line with a loan as easy as possible. Ask any questions you like. Terry and Katie are mo moderating them for me. 
if he thinks it's more relevant at the time, I'm sure to flow of it. And I often go really fast. If you find it too fast, don't worry. You can always ask a question later. And no, I can't give you a copy of the slides because it's not that worthwhile because there isn't that much data on it. But there's plenty of information and you can re-listen to this because this will be sent out for people. So feel free to connect any time and if you've got questions. Okay, so the six rules for lending well. And the key things I'm going to go through today are the equity you need, how that's assessed, how to structure, very briefly, how to service a loan, how to repay a loan, the conditions that banks are looking for now, your living expenses and briefly on credit files. There's been some major changes in credit files that you should be aware of. Okay, and I just want to start with this. Banks assess, lenders assess you two ways. One is on the equity that you have available and the second one is on the servicing. And you'd think, well, that's reasonably obvious, so as I know that, but every single week I get this question, hey, Louise, but I have a million dollars property and I only owe 200,000. How come you won't let me borrow another 200,000? And it all relates to the second part of the equation, which is the serviceability. So understand, you cannot borrow and pay for borrowings out of borrowings. Now, in the past, it might have appeared that's what you could do. Because certainly when I started lending, if you had a general income and a pulse, you could get a loan. That is no longer the case. So they are going through you and knowing everything about you, practically which side of the bed you sleep on. So be ready to uh, have, have that information and be prepared to give it away because the truth is with the internet today, they probably know it already. And if you think you're hiding, they will be knowing you possibly better than you do because they're already assessing you. Let me make that very clear. So questions to ask, and I know Terry's done this, his, he, before someone actually gets to the point of what everyone does, rock up to realestate.com and then go, oh, quick, I need a cheap loan, you know, look for the lowest interest rate. Wrong, wrong, wrong. What you need to go back and ask yourself is, well, what is your aim for this property? How long will I keep it? What's my age? Because it will depend, like Terry and I, looking a lot older than our photos on the first screen. So um, how long are we going to keep speaking, yourself? So. Yeah, I know you just haven't changed. I'm feeling older by the minute, but anyway. So your age, how long are you going to keep it? What's your intention for it? The biggest problem, as Terry, I'm sure, has uh, alluded to before, is people sell before they have made enough money out of their property. So you've got to get this into your plan before you actually get going. How much money am I going to need to hold it? And how much will I need to spend on it now and in the future? So you really need to get all that covered off before you get uh, started looking, even looking for a property. So how to assess your equity. Now, the loan-to-value ratio. At the moment, the top, it appears there's always someone, it appears, who will lend to you regardless, but it's a lot harder than it was. And the maximum that it appears that we can get is a loan-to-value ratio up to 95%. However, there are parameters around that. For investors, it's, it's a maximum of 95. You must pay principal and interest. They definitely want you to pay it down. And if it's at that high LVR level, and it can be higher for owner occupiers, but you must understand that that means that that 95% must include the lender's mortgage insurance. Now, what's lender's mortgage insurance? Any loan on a full doc loan above 80%, generally speaking, you will pay lender's mortgage insurance. And lender's mortgage insurance is insurance for the lender not the purchaser, it's, they will still come after you for the difference. It just protects the bank's borrowing capacity. How cool, they got you to pay for their insurance. How good is that for them? I wish it could work for me or, the, or us, but anyway. So your loan to value ratio is worked out by multiplying your house value by a percentage. So you say, well, and I'll give you an example in a minute, but if you wanted to repay as interest only, generally you cannot go above 80%, okay? That is the cutoff. So if you're thinking, well, I'm just going to, I used to be able to do this and I've got plenty and my first house I borrowed at 95 and that was no problem. Why can't I do it again? They are not keen. 
They are definitely not keen. And the excuses are, well, ASIC and APRA are looking down their shoulders and saying, why are you letting people borrow and not pay it back? In case the market falls out of itself, they want to have some buffer in the system. This is what they're looking for as a means of protecting you. Now, there's no doubt that the action of the um, regulators has worked in that interest-only lending for most banks is uh, overall now down at 15%. So it's much, much lower than ever before. So if you're hearing any uh, talks uh, or media in the, in the news yelling out that, oh, it's all, all going to fall apart when all the these interest only loans convert to PI or principal and interest. Don't believe it. Not, it's not necessarily so at all. So, an example of how to work out what that to get that LVR as high as you might want. So, say we're buying a purchase property for 550000 and we're borrowing at 90%, that equals a loan of 495 which means LMI of approximately 10000 at 90%, it can be around 10, can be higher, can be lower, depending on the institution. Oops. However, if you want to borrow over 90, say you want to borrow at 92, the lender's mortgage insurance premium jumps and it can be another 18,000 instead of 10 at 90 for an extra few thousand dollars. It, it jumps really high and it means you can't borrow at that level now because you'll be over the total 95. I hope that's clear for people, but if you ever want us to work out the figures because you're buying and you're doing a loan with us, we will always do all those figures for you. So always, our clients just send through and say, what do you think and we'll work it out for you. So 90 basically is the, is the maximum LVR you can go to for an investment in, and principal and interest at that rate, okay? So, but note, you finally work that out and then there'll be postcode restrictions and apartments that just simply lenders won't lend against. And I'm not talking about postcode restrictions because it's Moorumbah in, you know... Central Queensland. Yeah, central, central Queensland or, you know, Kununurra out in the west. We're talking about postcodes in, like, Abbotsford in Melbourne. So be very, very careful about what you're buying as well as just getting your loan prepared because there can be things that the lenders will come back later and say, well, no, we're not going to lend that to, on that property or there's too many apartments in that area, we're simply not lending above 80% or even 70% or some even lower. So be very, very careful. And on that note, people say, well, I've got a pre-approval. Let me assure you, a pre-approval is barely worth the paper it's written on. It's hard for me to, to get this through to people. It doesn't matter. All they're doing when they're doing a pre-approval is checking your credit score. Most of them, are, most of the lenders now are not doing an assessment on your file. They're not looking at you. If we've submitted it correctly, it'll be an automatic uh, approval. There'll be no full assessment. So if there's anything in your file that might come out later that you haven't declared, this can, can impact your lending ability. So be very, very careful about relying on a pre-approval. I would much, much prefer you always put a finance clause in your contracts when you're purchasing, unless you are extremely strong on paper and you know exactly what your capacity is or you've done the loan recently so we've been checked properly. So that would be the parameters around that, I would suggest. So that was on initially equity. Now let's talk about structuring. And I'm very, very briefly, this is really, I want you to ask your accountants to do this for you. Note you can borrow in a trust, which can be great. Um, there are unit trust, there's family trust, but there are restrictions around products that, that they might not offer you as a number of offsets or other things. Same with, uh, what was I going to say, companies, there can be issues around not getting the capital gains deduction, but if Labor gets in, well, that could all change anyway, that there won't be a deduction to get. Uh, personal names, obviously cheaper and easier, but may not offer you the asset protection you need. And you need to have decided what percentage of ownership that you should get if you're buying with someone else prior to coming for a loan. And they go, oh, can't we sort that out later? No, actually, that is part of the approval. The bank actually looks at the percentage that each of you might be contributing. It's not on the loan. It can be just the ownership of the property. So, for example, in a couple, 
um, of the wife might be earning significantly more than the husband, so we might put the property, the property might be have been decided to be in her name only, but both of them will be on the loan. But we need to know that before we apply. And that also needs to be, those parameters need to be on the contract. So please talk to your accountants before they love doing that sort of thing because it's much more interesting than their usual line of work. So, Louise, mm -hmm. do you want to deal with a couple of questions that are sort of coming in as we're speaking and relate to some of the things you've just said? For example, there's a couple of questions there, from one from Michael and one from Paul, about how do people know about those postcode restriction areas? Can you get a list? Um, no, it is really tricky, actually, and often it changes regularly. We can give you some guidance so when you're applying and you're looking in a certain area, ask your mortgage broker to, to verify for you with your particular lender, are there any restrictions? But that's one of the questions you've got to add to your list of criteria. So say, well, I'm looking in this area. Is this likely to be a problem with the lender we're looking at? So be very, very aware of doing that up front. And it's not a question. It often comes right at the end when you've actually bought and then you go, oh, hell, that's not going to work because I'm 10 grand short or 20 grand short. So just be uh, very uh, conscious of it. It's one of those parameters that can, can stymie a deal. And, a, and a, perhaps a related question from Ken, we're relating to regional areas. Is, is there any particular attitude coming through from lenders about regional areas? They're actually, I'm finding them a bit warmer towards regional areas, okay. which is great because obviously they're doing more there. There used to be a lot more restriction on regional areas. It, however, on size can be a problem. So if you're buying acreage, always be aware that a lot of lenders are less keen to buy anything over 20 acres, maybe even 15. I'm talking in acres, it should be hectares, but it's even less in hectares, isn't it? Yeah. But anyway, so be very aware that you're actually uh, not buying, if you're buying a, a unique type property, then there's parameter and restrictions around that for sure. It okay. does make a certain amount of sense because some of the strongest markets in Australia where, where prices are actually rising, contrary to what media keeps telling us, mm are in some of these uh, regional cities like, like Ballarat and Bendigo and Victoria, for example, Newcastle and New South Wales, very, very strong markets. So perhaps banks are uh, well informed and realise that some of these regional areas are actually good markets to lend in at the moment. Oh, absolutely. And some of the second tier lenders used to be the ones who were more conscious of, they were a bit more nervous about lending in the regional areas, but now they're really going for it. So because they can see there's a huge opportunity there. And if we can stack up the figures, we know what rent we're getting. It's, it, it goes through really easily. Yeah. So, and it's good that they're actually supporting communities like that because previously those sort of regional areas were left to the major banks, but since they're closing all their branches anyway, yeah. there's an opportunity for us to go in and do something about it. And uh, where we're doing loans for people all over the country, Darwin, out west, right up to Queensland and north and right down the, the coast, the east coast, and Adelaide and it's amazing so you can see a whole variety of people and where they're buying in lots of different places and so there's certainly lenders who previously might not have looked there but now will so that's great the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was just maintain your personal debt separate from your investment debt now that's a fairly obvious point but it's amazing the number of people too who say to me oh I've got money to pay that deposit I'll just draw it out of my home loan no you won't well you shouldn't because that actually contaminates the home loan and the investment debt and it, and it rather breaks the nexus so it's no longer tax deductible. So I want you to be very aware of that. Do not redraw on your own home to go and buy an investment. That would be a really bad move. Okay. Oops. What have we got? There we go. Oh, and that's another reason. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because people sometimes ask me, oh, I want to... Uh, Borrow in a trust with, uh, say, Terry and I will buy, we wouldn't be doing this because it would be stupid, but uh, buy, one person will buy, create a trust and a company to buy a property half bought by someone else with a second company and then we're going to uh, renovate it and flip it. And I can tell you they're not words that any broker wants to hear and the reason is this. Up to two years after we've finished a loan, should you change or sell that property or change the loan within that period, 
we get clawed back. So any money we have made for all that enormous amount of effort we've put up front, they, they will take back from us. I don't know if there's another industry in the world where they actually do this. They say, oh, we've paid you now, that's all good and well. And then two years down the track, they go, oh, geez, the clients have now changed their mind, you're gonna pay it back. So let me tell you, if a broker is not getting back to you because that's your scenario, let me explain, that's why. And some people probably don't like to tell you that. I just wanna let you know, if you're finding any resistance there, that is why. So. I would always explain to clients because you need to know what's going on. It's really frustrating otherwise. So just so you know, if you're finding any resistance, take those sort of scenarios to your big four. They're the ones who best to do with that. Just letting you know. So just to recap where we're up to, so we've covered off where you, what equity you're in and we've talked about 95% lead, including lenders mortgage insurance or 80% for interest only talked a little bit about structure with trusts and companies and personal. Now we're going to go on to how to service a loan. So a couple of key rules around this. PAYG, probation is fine now for a lot of major lenders. Uh, it depends on some, if you're in the same industry, absolutely no trouble with a lot of the minor lenders, you know, minor lenders as well, second tier lenders as well. Just note on your pay slip, sometimes people will have payments made out to this and that and whatever. Make sure you explain all that up front because those are the sort of things that can be counteracted by credit. And if you're dealing with a loan officer who isn't that smart or all over it, or maybe they just forgot, make sure if those sort of things can be negatives without even you realising and they're counting it against you in credit, but you don't even see that behind the scenes. So I want you to be aware, you've explained up front, well, on my pay slip, I pay this much to this account and this much to this account, and the banks want to see all of those accounts. So, so you can explain where they're going and what they're for. You might have a maxia payment, like a tax, a pre-tax payment. All of those items you need to get, get explained before you actually go there. A lot of people now are doing the lifestyle thing and buying leave up front. Again, explain for how long. Have you got a letter verifying that? When is it going to stop? Because those things can count against your serviceability. And you might not be aware, and that's why your loan's been refused, and yet actually it was going to finish in, in a week or two's time. But that wasn't explained to the credit officer, so they just refused it. Because it's easier for them to just say no than actually go and investigate. They want it done for them. So make their life easy. They're busy very busy and so you want to have it all laid out and very easy for them. Again with bonuses, usually you must have a bonus displayed on two years and at least be consistent. Even if you've changed jobs in that two years, if it's a consistent sales jobs for example, then you've got a bonus in the previous place and you probably expected to get a bonus in this one and that's how it will work. They usually want to see it on your payment summaries for the last two years. So go with them, be ready. Any regular allowances, explain them. I always get, you know, for example, a uniform allowance. So explain that, that, that actual increase there or that addition in my pay is a regular and routine part of my work. So you know. So when you're explaining to the people who are helping you organise the loan, that's all there and up, up front and clear. When you're self-employed, we generally need your ABN to have been established for two years at least two years, but preferably two years, and one full year's financials. Now, some of the lenders, oh, we will always ask for two years as a broker, I will always ask for two years and we can verify exactly what's going on with your company. However, some lenders will accept only one year. Generally, they're only major lenders. Most minor lenders will, or second tier, will accept uh, two years and do an average of the two. Sometimes we can say, well, that's this much late this year. We've had a much better year, so we want to use the figures on this year as the new on forward and average. So we're not going to average down. We want you to average up. And that can sometimes be explained. So make sure you've got that information for them as well. Next on rent. One of the things sometimes people send me is a, a summary from the annual uh, rental return. I don't want that. It's no help to me because generally they'll just show a massive deductions taken by your agents for whatever and whatever, smoke alarm, blah, blah, blah. I, I don't want the lenders to see that either. What I want is a one month statement that shows a weekly amount preferably because the way you can work out the rent is per week rent, say it's 700, divide by seven, 
$100 a day multiplied by 365 equals 36,500. So that's what I can use as the maximum rental income for that property. Don't go telling me, oh, well, it was this and it's now this. I don't want to know. I just want to know what it is at this month. And usually a one month statement will show that. And that's how you work it out. So to get the rental return that you should be getting, and, and it's good for you to check. If you've got this on your rental statements, check. What are you getting per week? Divide by seven, multiply by 365, and that equals what you should be getting a year. And a lot of people don't know and are actually getting under what they should be because property managers might not have worked it out correctly. So that is how it's supposed to be done. And you can check with the um, residential tenancies tribunal in each state. They will verify that with you. Valuations, be sure that the valuations, when a lender's looking at you, the valuation matches what the weekly rent is. Sometimes values will go in and go, oh, well, we think it's gonna rent like this. But actually the place rents at a much higher rate. And I'm not talking Airbnb, I'm just talking a weekly rent say. So for example, I had a client was getting a rent of uh, 1,750 a week, yet the value had come back and said 1,650 a week. And the, and the credit assessor had actually assessed it at 1,650. So we lost $100 a week in income, which was huge. And I had to discover that before. I'd say, what are you doing differently to me? And it was about getting on the phone and arguing with them saying, hey, you can't do that. And I had to go back and dispute the valuation to get that rent raised because we had leases in place that proved our rent was $17.50. So note that you can actually, you, you need to know these things and you need to verify. So you need to provide the proof upfront for the broker in the first place, okay? How, how critical is the whole issue of valuations? Can that be a stumbling block, um, particularly with the propensity of some lenders to doing sort of what you might call a desktop valuation, where a proper valuation isn't carried out, and sometimes the, the app they are using comes back with a silly figure? Silly being high or low? Well, too low quite often. I don't usually find that to be the case anymore. Yeah. I'm finding more and more... If I have a really low valuation come back on a desktop, we can actually escalate to, uh, for a reason, to no question. We can escalate to get a full valuation. So you can do that. They've come back with a figure from a desktop that isn't helpful. Absolutely. You can insist it and I will you. actually go back with reasons and I'll say to the client, well, what's happened to this property during the last 12 months or two years that, that's different from what we should expect? in that area and and then we will say right well that place has got a new kitchen new garage we've got new concrete we've got full full garden and a pool hell's bells it's worth clearly a lot more and i will actually go back and tell them that and i'll say you can see what's going out of their account over the last little bit that's why they've been paying for these upgrades or they've been renovating or for a reason and someone might say oh you know the place down the street though just sold for blah that's no good to me. It has to be into the valuation system, which means it has to have been settled virtually for three months before we can actually use the figures. So don't tell me something down the street just sold for whatever figure. It needs to have been three months prior, okay? So just so you're aware of that. But we can usually, I'm not finding valuations coming in too low at all, but maybe because we're purchasing well, so. Okay. Might be on the other side, they're feeling a bit pained. Just just a question that's just popped up on the panel, Louise, that relates to something you just said, talking about the sort of information you need to provide. And that's a question about is it how different is it when you're self-employed in terms of what you need to apply? Oh, massively different. Uh, look, it shouldn't be all that different. The great thing about when you're self-employed and you're dealing with financials at an institution, the your actual level of credit assessment is a lot higher because they're a bit more sophisticated and they've been doing it a lot longer. So they're more likely to be able to understand financials and help you through the process. So with any luck, I don't find that it's a burden at all. It's just as long as it's presented in the right way. So you've got to give it every shot. You've got to know what you're doing. So please go to a, a, a broker who's actually experienced in that method of uh, and dealing with, it's ask them, do you deal with many self-employed and can you, is this a routine thing for you? Okay. Because is it, is it the case that generally lenders tend to have a put self-employed people in a particular category, perhaps higher risk? Yes, certainly. And that's why we want to explain in any application, as I've said to you, give the story, put down the information. We've been running this business successfully for this long and we expect to blah, do, do, do. You know, and okay. we have, and this is our intention for paying this off and we know what we're doing. We're clearly running our business well. You can see our balance sheet. 
uh, you know, it depends. We're, we're clearly not just looking at... Uh, we, the other thing is you do need preferably to be making a profit. And people go, oh, yes, but I've been drawing out funds for this and that and the other. Good luck with that one. You need to at least look like you're... Uh, and, and I know accountants will often diminish what you've done and add in everything to reduce tax. The year you want to borrow, plan it and actually have a great return because you only need one. But I, I, this is part of the process. I think you're shooting yourself on the foot. Try to diminish the amount of income that you're showing in your business so you pay less tax because when you come to get a loan, it's actually um, the opposite of beneficial to you. Oh, really difficult, yeah. yeah but most people don't kind of think it think that far ahead with what they're doing. No, they say, oh, but I had a trip overseas and I claimed all this and that. No, that's great. That's great, but it won't help you then. Now pay for it, now you're back. So you've got to, you've got to get your lending sorted first, then go plan your life a bit later. And if you need help with that, I've got people who can help you with that too. Um, just on Airbnb uh, rent return, uh, don't think, oh, because I'm now getting, you know, 30 grand and it's all fabulous on something I would have got, you know, 10 grand for. Uh, unless you're running it as an actual business and it's appearing in your tax return for a couple of years, lenders don't really want to know about it. They'll just use a, a normal routine under 5% usually and the yield they'll cut off at 5 for sure. So it doesn't matter no matter what you're earning there unless you can actually count it as a business and that it's in your tax return as such. But then they will, but if it's not, don't bother. It's, they're going to use just a 5% or under. Okay, next, I just want to bring you to uh, quickly go through other liabilities. Credit cards, 150 per month off servicing for every $5,000 credit card. Now, I found I had some people I could have saved eight grand a year on interest recently, and I had a $34,000 credit card. I said, You're going to have to reduce your card. They're not even using it. But that they like, oh, no, but we love our credit cards. I say, well, sorry, can't help you, which is crazy, you know, insane. So try and get rid of them and down. And the other thing I find regularly when trawling through credit card statements for people is you're paying, particularly the major banks, a lot of international fees on transactions. Because people are now buying all the time on the web, you're getting slugged fees. Now, Citibank and ING both have accounts that charge you no international transfer fees. They're debit cards, but you can still use them online. So, you know, look at this because you're just wasting money. I, I got caught myself recently, $5 for a $200 purchase Some because I picked up the wrong card. Stupid. I was so annoyed with myself. <laughs> I hate wasting money like that. Anyway, so just be aware. Uh, we can all, you know, all watch more and more. Help debt. Uh, if you have a help debt, you need to, you know, this is an education debt. It's, you need to be, uh, even if you're not earning enough income to pay it back, technically, they will actually start charging you interest if you are not paying anything at all. Did you know that? Heaps of people don't. And they end up with, they go, oh, my help debt was 15000 a couple of years ago. Now it's twenty one. What happened there? Well, hello. Guess what? Government was charging you interest and you didn't even realise. So what I advise you is, and they go, oh, but it's supposed to be free, you know, a, you know, interest-free debt, but it's not. Once you're due and working, they will just start accumulating interest. So you need to pay something off that every year. I don't care, $500, $1,000. Usually it's 7%. Once you're at the level, it's 7% a year, even if you're not paying it. So that's what the lenders will work it out on. So if you owe you know, 7% of whatever it might be that you owe. So count that into your servicing because that's what will be deducted. Just be aware of it. But if you have a help debt and you are only earning, say, 30 grand a year, still try and put a couple of hundred bucks towards it every year. It is really important to make sure that they know you're, you're trying to pay it down because you could end up with a much higher interest bill for nothing and, and you, just because you didn't realise. Furniture loans, oh, for God's sake, just don't do it if you don't have to. It just cuts cuts into your servicing. And people go, oh, but it was only, you know, five grand at Nick Scarly. Oh, goody gumdrops. But please try not to do these sort of things, particularly if you're going for a major house loan. They go, oh, but I got these loans really easily. Yes, you can, because they'll come and slug you. And it's interesting in a lot of the fine print, they say, well, if you've got a house, they're going to come and get you on that anyway. So watch out, you think. 
Zip pay, after pay, people often forget to tell us that they've got these debts. They will appear on your credit file. They go, oh, yeah, but I'm paying it off and it's only over four times. It's all got to be declared on a loan application. Be very aware of these, these little debts that run up. Car loan's the same. Do all of that sort of thing once you've got the house loan. Don't do it before. Okay, and any companies that you no longer use, often people have started a company at some point, you'll need either to close it down if you're not using it now, pardon me now, or get an accountant's letter that it's not trading and has no tax or other liabilities. That's really important too. So just note, be aware of all of those debts can in, in, counteract your uh, serviceability and, and decrease your chance of getting a loan. Oh, this is what it feels like. I've just got to show you this boomerang. I love boomerang. This is what my day is often like. I love this app. It's just fun. But anyway, <laughs> banging my heads against the wall trying to get loans through. But that's what it feels like. So all of those things, you can help us help you by having them declared and upfront. Okay? Next, how to repay a loan. So rates at the moment can be as low as for principal interest for investment, 3.74. Um, for owner-occupied, you can be down at 3.59, 3.69. Sometimes linking your owner-occupied security with your investment will actually mean you'll get a better rate across the whole lot. If you have a standalone investment, often that will mean it'll, it'll be charged a lot higher. You also might not realise that for interest only, any time you're leaving a loan on interest only, whether owner-occupied or investment, you will be paying a penalty for that at the lenders. They all were overjoyed when um, the regulators asked them to rein in investment-only lending and they instantly put up all the rates across every loan. And I reckon they've had a mozza from it this last 12 months. It's been crazy. And, they, and so them to bleed about funding, it just makes me just not believe them in any stretch. Just note that there's some very good fixed rates out there. They really want you to fix because they want to keep you there. The uh, issue, and with a lot of those intro rates, be a little wary of grabbing an intro rate because they're really low because if you are sure at the end of that two-year period, you can refinance or move if you need to because often the end of, particularly with the major bank, they have these fabulous intro rates, but they are the ones that revert to the highest rate after and they are very loath to reduce them once you're there because they think people are stuck and they'll just pay. So they don't mind offering you a really good rate, you know, to get to suck you in and then they'll charge you uh, a premium because they can. So be, be aware and make sure you can change if you need to. So think long-term about your lending. Don't just think for today and say, oh, that's a great rate, I'll lock that in. One thing, though, to get a rate under like 4.5% for five years just doesn't feel that painful from my point of view because, but mind you, I did live through the 80s and that was like 19.25% at one point that we were paying. Mm. So just so, if I, you know, 4.5% for five years, if you're buying an investment, you think it's going to rent, pretty well and you're not going to have a change in circumstances, then wow, what about it? Just lock it away and leave it there and it can be that sort of investment that just sits there and pays itself down a bit. I think that could be well worthwhile. Lines of credit, they really don't want you to have them. The rates are really hideous. Just be aware and always ask. But, you know, from interest only, early fours, three to five percent, fixed, we can get better rates. Actually, I've got one today, 4.09 at one lender, interest only for investment, which is really great. So just depends on who and what, what's out there and for what your circumstances and what it all fits into the equation. So the other thing to be aware of, be ready to explain reasons why you're interest only. They really want to know because they have to account to it for us, for tax purposes, you've got to say, well, it's recommended by your accountant or your tax, your financial planner to assist with budgeting and cash flow. Wouldn't say that's all I can afford. Hello. People actually tell me this and go, oh, but that's all I can afford. Well, then you probably can't afford this loan. Because the problem with going interest only is the bank was then servicing you on five years interest only, say you get five years. They then say, well, you've got to service that loan on 25 years. So that by even asking for the five years, that means at the start, you will be penalised when they go to service your loan. I don't know if that's clear, but I hope it is. 
No, try it again. Try it again. So usually a loan is serviced over 30 years, principal and interest. However, if you ask for five years interest only, at the initial servicing, they're going to say, well, you're going to pay that loan off over 25 years. So it's actually a higher repayment. And that's counted from the start. So be aware of that. Sometimes it might be better to ask for one year interest only or two years interest only and then convert it again when you get the opportunity in a couple of years' time than asking for full five years up front. Be aware of that, okay? Um, how you, they're looking to how you're going to repay. You could say, well, you, you might downsize your home and pay some debt off. That will work some places, others will not. Um, don't offer to use your super to pay off your debt. They don't like it. I'm just telling you. If they're looking for a reason, that's not going to work. Okay. So next, I'm just going to cover off. We've gone through now your equity, your structure, and how to service a loan, and how to repay. So obviously, the lenders are wanting you to repay by principal interest because that's what's working, and that's what they've been made to do by the regulators, and that's what they're offering the best discounts for. So if you can lock that in, pay it off, then that's probably... But it depends on your intention for the property. But be aware it can hurt your servicing going interest only and you'll certainly pay generally a higher interest rate. Living expenses. Ah, now the reason why they're all in a tiz about living expenses, and I love this article I found that said um, from uh, St George, a survey done that said one in four people are keeping a financial secret from their partner, which is hilarious. They have secret bank account, secret debt, secret credit cards. And I know this from actually having interviewed lots and lots of people getting a loan that, that someone might say, I, I, I'll go, is that all your debt? And they'll go, so tell me later. So, okay. So I understand that people might keep things uh, secret, but, and the banks know, and they'll know before you know, or your partner knows. So they've already got this information if you've got, they'll be looking through your account. So on that, oh, here's another article. This was from Christopher Joyce in the Australian Financial Review. And this was the case that was brought, that people saying, well, you know, that the banks have been indulging in irresponsible lending. And it's, they're saying, well, no, it wasn't true. And Christopher Joyce's article said that droves of Aussies are indeed defrauding the banks by lying on their home loan applications, which is like, you know, so it's interesting. Whoops, sorry. And uh, one of the things here, he said, the legacy of this Royal Commission and this, this, focus on living expenses and that people should be actually declaring what they're actually using is a legacy. It's going to be much harder to get approved for a loan and that's certainly proven to be the case. And the, the penalty will be higher interest rates to cover the costs of the compliance and that's the fear of it actually, that they're uh, finding it difficult to, to cover. And they're saying that people, human beings are not very good at keeping track and declaring their expenses. So... Originally, oh, ASIG and Westpac statement, this was interesting, said 81% of declared living expenses were below the HEM, which is the poverty index. So people were declaring their living expenses way less than they really spend. And so the banks now, what they're doing is saying, show us three months of your savings account where your pay is going to, and if your pay goes into two accounts or three accounts for whatever reason, you need to show all of those accounts and three months. So here's the one thing. If you do nothing else, go home tonight, pull out the account that you're getting paid into or that you're using regularly and verify what are all the things I've been spending my money on because the bank will be looking. Now, a great example of a case that uh, recently someone was refused a loan, a first home buyer, so they're usually the flavour of the month. Two, he had a 50% loan to value ratio, so plenty of cash to put into the equation, great serviceability, except in his savings account he had regular online betting <laughs> and he was refused a loan. Yeah. I know. So be aware. Now, I know there's all sorts of things that you might have going out of your credit card or savings account for things that you might not want other people to see. Be aware they will be looking. And if you're banking at the same bank you're going for a loan, they will know more than your last three months. So be aware of that and look at your last three months at least or six months and say, well, what have I been spending it on? What can they see? 
that I, that I should have to declare. And the thing is, they, they say, yes, if there are large amounts of cash payments into or out of accounts, they want to know what it's going on about. Watch how you label transactions. If you come to me and say, well, you know, I don't have any debt, and then, and then it says paying back, you know, Martha, paying back bill, paying back whatever, each each week out of your account. Can you mind, you know, if, you, if you're labelling things like that, well, it's very difficult for us to say, well, no, they don't owe anything anywhere else. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing what people will do. And payments to non-declared liabilities. So, you know, if you don't declare those liabilities and then you say, oh, yeah, but that was just there, you can be sure the lenders will find it. So we have to look at all your savings accounts and your credit cards. Previously, banks would have just used the higher of what you declare and the HEM. Now they're they're not accepting the HEM. They need you to, unless I have a wonderful client who recently said, look, I get all my power from the panel, from my solar panels. I'm actually, you know, getting money from the grid, not, um, you know, charged for it. And the next thing is he said, and I go out and shoot deer when I want food. I go, oh, my God, I don't know if I need to know this. But he said, that's why my expenses are so low. So I can go to the lender and say, well, here's his, his reason, and this is explained, and you can see it in his savings account. So, but, so being a deer hunter actually helps you if you're running out of time. <laughs> Maybe if you can stand eating it as well. <laughs> and hunting either either I, I said oh I don't know if I, I really want to know but anyway but the, the thing they're looking for is if you say well my living expenses are two thousand a month and I'm earning four thousand a month where's the other two are they going into savings well if they're not into savings where's it going so if you don't have anything you need to be able to be aware of that and they're looking just note we have all these calculators on my website at the property education and there's heaps of Oh, whoops, 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 sorry. So, we're nearly there. Oh, my gosh, so much for 30 minutes. I can talk, talk, talk. Yeah, I know. I talk way too much. You interrupted me. It must be you. That was the questions, so. though. Yeah, it's the questions. We'll blame the participants. That's great. Okay, so there's the calculators, and these are really handy to go and check what your loan repayments will be or, you know, all sorts of things that might help you. So go on along to the website and have a look. Next, your credit file. Do get your credit file at mycreditfile.com.au. Equifax is the main provider. They're the biggest in the country. There are two others. One is Dun & Bradstreet. They, theirs doesn't seem to be as comprehensive in my view. And there's one in Tasmania just for Tassie. Aren't they clever? However, once a year you can pull your file for free. You should do this absolutely categorically. Now, previously, you should be able to, after five years, anything that was, you know, a, that you got previously just dropped off. But that is no longer the case. And Scott Morrison has made the banks be involved in positive reporting. And by the end of this year, they're all supposed to be able to do this. And this is what the result will be. So here's an example of an Equifax page. Someone with a national um, credit card and it's a revolving line of credit, it's five grand, it's unsecured. And what it's showing here is, was it paid on time? And the R is not reported, so there wasn't anything due then. So if you are late and you regularly pay accounts late, this will now be recorded on your credit file. Now, there is a grace period, but for a lot of it, you need to be aware. If you're regularly paying a couple of weeks late or a week late and the banks are having to constantly remind you, they're going to start putting it on your credit file. And the other thing you should note is this credit card was opened in 1992. 1992. So previously, this would not have appeared on a credit file, but now because it's an open line of credit or an available credit, they report it to Equifax. And, and when does this style of reporting actually start? Well, it started now. Okay, Some of the lenders are already doing it, as you can see, National Bank. Some of the others are still, they're still trying to get it organised in there, but they're supposed to have it in by the end of this year. Okay. As far as I'm aware, whether they've gone back to Scott and Morrison and said, no, we can't do it, but that's what was the aim. So out of interest anyway. So that's really important. You can see that although there is a grace period and if you are just a day late on something, wouldn't the bank get the fee reversed if they're charging you, you know, they slip it in those $5 fees? Make sure you're onto it. Watch your account and make sure that any of those fees, you say, look, I usually pay on time. Don't go charging me a fee just for this one-off because it can affect your file. So I really want you to be very careful about this because I anticipate that they're going to start offering di different credit ratings for people depending on how good their files are. And the other thing you should be aware of is if you have five 
applications per annum. Say you did a zip pay, an energy, momentum energy, a phone, you went for a new, you know, Vodafone, whatever, you 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 rented a property and you did something else. There's five before you've applied for a loan, that would be often an automatic cutout in a credit application. Are you suggesting that a person's credit rating could affect the interest rate they're asked to pay? Yes, I believe that could possibly come in the future. Okay. I would be I would be surprised if that's not where it's heading. Yeah. Because they have the data now to do that. Right. So be aware how many times you hit your file. If you're going for a loan in the next 12 months, we'll think, no, no more zip pay, no more car loans. Just focus on the house. <laughs> do us a favour. <laughs> anyway, oh, we use bankstatements.com. So when we want people and we want to have a look at their bank statements, it's a simple, easy tool that people can use. You just click onto our link. We send you a portal we use. So everything's very secure in the portal. And people go, oh, I'm not sure I want to log in through this portal and send you bank statements. And I would tell you that if you think it, you're already on the web, the banks don't know about it, everyone knows about it. It's all out there. So although we do our absolute best and have massive levels of security, and this company we've known to be very uh, rigorous in their security formations, I would suggest uh, it's the simplest and easiest way and it's very quick. So it's great. You just collect your bank, you log in to, through your own and then it just click, tick, 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 all the accounts and it automatically sends us the data, which is really handy. And caution, just a caution, another one from despair.com. Disaster awaits those who ignore the hidden threats. We trust that you find this sufficiently motivating to go and seek a broker and get help. But anyway... So, any burning questions now still? There have been a few coming in while you've been speaking and, and I do remind people watching and listening that if you do have questions, type them into the, either the chat panel or the Q&A panel that you should see in your screen in front of you and we'll do our best to answer those in the time we have left. Um, Dom's question, the other week, just refers back to something you said about credit card. You mentioned that there's $150 per month of servicing for certain credit card limits, you just missed the, the figure, was it? The $5,000 per 150. That's, per, you know, that's an example, generally speaking. So how does that work? So for every $5,000, they take... Of a credit limit that you've got Of 5000 Yeah. And it's kind of credit limit, not what you're using. Yeah. So it's the limit. So if you have a limit of, say, um, so for every 5000 it's 150 so 10000 it's 300 so it can vary like that, just to give you a parameter around how that works. So that means you've got to earn another $300 a month of income to overcome those credit limits. Or just reduce them down for the sake of the application. That's the sensible thing to do. Just whack it down to one or 2000 and then go for your, your loan. It's just much simpler to do. Okay, we've got a couple of questions and they both right, relate to the question of how lenders... Um, regard people according to their age. Karina's asking, are the banks making it harder for people in their 50s to borrow, given that loan terms are 25 to 30 years? And we earlier had a question come in from Miguel and Anton Yetta, who are clients of mine, mm. who um, recently bought an investment property. They're in their early 70s. and um, Great. Well done. And, and they plan to do it again, mm -hmm. perhaps next year. Um, and they're asking, is getting that, that second that loan for that second property going to be difficult for them given that they are in their 70s? What, what's the attitude of banks in those two situations? We need to have an exit strategy. Yeah. So I did hint at that. Some lenders, no matter what your age, will lend on a 30-year term still. And then it's up to you about how you work out, how you pay it back and, and whatever ultimately. But the majors certainly won't. Generally, they will limit, most of the majors, I shouldn't be such a blanket thing, will limit the uh, term of your ca uh, borrowing capacity. Yeah. Well, Miguel and Antonio, you know, the loan they had for the property they bought recently was limited to 15 years because of their age. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've got lenders who will do the opposite. They'll insist on no lower than 15 and maybe a 30-year term. So it just depends. Yes, there's... It's confusing. Yeah, it is. And so it, it, they certainly want to know how you intend to pay it off. They don't want to see you use your super to do it. So you have to think about, well, what is my exit strategy for this property and what am I trying to get out of it? And is it going to work in the time frame that I want? 
So am I going to hold it for 10 years and then and is it in the right area? That's why you need Terry, to make sure you're in the right spot to start with so that you're not sitting there in 10 years' time going, well, that was a lemon. I'm still sitting here 10 years later and it hasn't grown. So that's really important. I said I asked the question about uh, Linda's energy to properties like dual occupancy property. Are there any particular... Oh, that can, it depends. Again, yes, there can be... There's a lot of restrictions around dual locks. Uh, yes. <laughs> Where do I begin and end? Uh, depends on the type of property. Depends if you're buying, you know, both sides. If it's got a joining wall. If you've got an adjoining wall with someone else. You know, there's lots of restrictions around that. So be wary. So get seek advice before you get into one of those. So all these things just add to the complexity that we've been That's talking right. about today. You need to know about that. And people go, well, why is it so hard? Well, where, because if they can, as I said, choose who they want as a, as a borrower, then the banks will do that. They want the best. They want, like ING, people go, oh, ING is fabulous, but they service people at 8%. Most lenders will service them at 7.25 or 7%. You can buy a lot more property when you're being serviced at 7% or lower than you can when you're being serviced at eight. So they only want people who've got big incomes. They've made that very clear in their market and the way they, they deal with people, yeah. You had made a comment right at the beginning, Louise, about um, get me out of those big four. And um, I'm finding myself talking, having conversations with investors increasingly about the other possibilities beyond the big four, the second tier lenders, etc. But quite often what comes back at me is people have this, this fear that, um, those smaller lenders are, are riskier somehow that they might go broke and they're going to have a problem. What, what's the response to those sorts of concerns? Yeah, it's interesting. I find people are not, uh, because they haven't looked at second tier lending, but a lot of them have huge financial backing, whether it's from industry funds and or banks. A lot of them have been lending for 50 plus years, yeah. but you're just not aware of them because they don't, they're not advertising and they are word of mouth or they rely on deposits from people. They often, there's some really exciting new funders coming in. Some funders who've been dealing primarily in the uh, low doc and e credit impaired space have now had a big influx of funds coming into this country and they're going, well, heck, we don't just have to deal with credit impaired. We can give, because the banks are not giving these people loans, anyone who's an investor, we, they're good. We know they'll pay. We can lend to them. And so they, they give you a reasonable interest rate. They might charge you a risk fee, but they'll actually give you a loan, whereas the majors won't give you a loan. So they're actually servicing you a lot easier. It's, it can be a little more expensive up front because they want to cover their base, but they're actually very secure. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for people that you might not have thought about before. And the regulatory requirements imposed from above are quite stringent in terms of both the way banks and other lenders have to be set up in terms of... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They can't. It's not... Well, it, it's surprising. Still with the those... Uh, Prospers and the spot caps and the rate setters and those type of lenders have very, uh, the, their criteria is a lot less complicated if you're getting an unsecured loan. Try not to go there if you, unless you're absolutely desperate. If you can manage to, to borrow against a property, that's easier and better for you. But if you need it short term, just get it, pay it off quickly as you can and then move on. But I would prefer to see people, there's lots of, Second tier lenders that have the ability you can service a loan and get quite a reasonable rate, but you would never have thought of them before. But they're actually servicing and giving people fabulous opportunities that they wouldn't, they just wouldn't be able to get. So they're out there. Okay, Louise, we've uh, clicked over the hour. I think that we've covered a lot of really great information. But people actually dealt with a lot of the questions that were coming in as as they came in. Um, oh, I, I had one final thing I wanted to tell you. Okay. So, you know, which way, it's interesting, which way you roll your paper can tell how much money, whether you're going to make more money or less. Now, you'll be interested to know that people who roll under are more creative and generally more. Is this one on the left? Yes. But people who roll over, of course, 
make more money because they must be a bit anal. And if you have ever been someone who's the sort who will go in and adjust the way a toilet roll is rolling. That's, that's me. That's me. So we're, we're hanging this way. Uh, just note that, that you might make more money. That's, that's the supposedly someone's done a survey on that. But anyway, so if you need any help, please feel free to contact us. You can book an appointment with me on calendly.com, Saxo or Louise at propertyed.com. Anyway, thank you, Terry. It's been fun. It has been fun. And I'd, I'd just like to end, Louise, with um, this comment that's just coming from Sam. And he says, I think he sums it up very nicely. Thanks, Louise and Terry. Outstanding content. Very informative and insightful. Well, I thought so. Thank you. And I think um, if people um, haven't got good information today, you weren't paying attention, if you'd like to follow up and find out more or perhaps um, deal with your, your own specific uh, circumstance. Um, yeah, we love helping people. What we have on the screen is how you contact Louise to, to follow up and ask more questions or to perhaps to ask an attack for you and um, find the line that's going to suit your uh, particular needs. So thank you, Louise. And don't forget, go home and review your savings accounts and check what's going out because there's 13 different area and criteria that banks are looking at and you want to know what they are for yourself. So it's a really good way of doing it. You actually said that to me um, just a couple of weeks ago, that this has become the most important thing, to know exactly what you're spending as and have, have that under control. And perhaps if you're planning to go for a loan three months from now, start now and limiting your spending. Yeah. So that it actually looks better when they look at those three months I of bank statement. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We had a great crowd and today lots of good questions and great information from Louise Lucas from a property education company. That's it for now. Terry Ryder from hotspotting.com.au signing off. We'll do it again soon.